I played this song for the students to show them that this is what you will hear behind every message coming at you from another human being if you connect to the divine energy in that person at that moment. See me beautiful Look for the best in me That's what I really am And all I want to be It may take some time It may be hard to find But see me beautiful Hello, my name is Marshall Rosenberg. I'm grateful for your attention and I'm going to be sharing with you a process that we call nonviolent communication. I'll be sharing its purpose with you and how it's being used by people throughout the world at a number of different levels. I'll show you how it's being used within ourselves how it's used to create the quality of connections with others at home, at work, that we would like to have. And I'll be showing you how it's applied in social change work. So it was on my mind repeatedly as a child, as growing up. What is it that gets into people, that makes them want to harm people for reasons such as their name, their religion, their background, their skin color? And fortunately, I was also exposed to the other side of human beings. For example, my grandmother was totally paralyzed, and my mother was caring for her. And each evening, an uncle of mine would come to our house to help my mother care for my grandmother. And the whole time, he was cleaning her up and feeding her. He had the most beautiful smile on his face. So as a boy, I kept wondering, how come there are people like my uncle who seem to enjoy contributing to the well-being of other people? And then how come this other aspect of human beings, that they want to do violence to one another? So those questions were on my mind as I was growing up, and when it came time to make some decision about what kind of work I wanted to do, I thought I'd like to study and find out more about human beings and what makes some human beings enjoy contributing to the well-being of others, and what makes some human beings want to do violence to others. I chose clinical psychology to find out what I could about those two questions, and got a doctor's degree in psychology. But there were some limits to what I was taught. It didn't answer the questions as well as I would like. But I was more interested in learning how we were meant to live. So I studied on my own after graduate school to try to find out what I could about why people like my uncle enjoy contributing to the well-being of others and why others seem to enjoy making others suffer. And I came to what I'll be sharing with you from a number of different sources. The main one was to study the people that I really admired. And I studied comparative religions to see if I could learn some things from the basic religions. Did they seem to have some agreement about how we were meant to live? And some research was very helpful to me. Research of Carl Rogers studying characteristics of a healing relationship. From all of these sources, I put together a process that was based on my desire of how I would like human beings to behave, because nonviolent communication is really an integration of a spirituality with concrete tools for manifesting this spirituality in our daily lives, our relationships, and in our political activities. We want people to change, not because of fear that we're going to punish them if they don't, or guilt them if they don't. We want them to change because they see better ways of meeting their needs at less cost. So let's look at how that change can occur within ourselves, with other people whose behavior is not in harmony with our values, 
and with social structures that are behaving in ways that are not in harmony with our values. First, ourselves. Think of a mistake you made recently, something you did that you wished you hadn't done. How do you educate yourself when you have done something that you wished you hadn't done? That is, what did you tell yourself at the moment that you saw what you had done? The other day I was doing a training with some people and we were seeing how nonviolent communication can be used within ourselves to learn from our limitations without losing self-respect. And a woman picked a situation that she had been screaming at her child that morning before coming to the training. She said some things to the child that she wished she hadn't done and she saw the look in the child's eyes she saw how hurt the child looked. And I asked her this question. How did you educate yourself at that moment? What did you say to yourself? And she said, I said, what a terrible mother I am. I said to myself, I shouldn't have talked that way to the child. I said, what's wrong with me? Unfortunately, that's how many people educate themselves. They educate themselves in the way that people educated us when we did things that authorities didn't like. They blamed us, punished us, so we internalize that. So now we often educate ourselves through guilt, shame, and other forms of violent, coercive tactics. So we know we're doing that. We know that we are educating ourselves in a violent way. Three feelings will tell us that depression, guilt, and shame. You see, I think we feel depressed a good deal of the time, not because it means we're ill or something is wrong with us, but because we have been taught to educate ourselves with moralistic judgments, to blame ourselves, to think like this mother did, that because she had screamed at her child that there was something wrong with her, she was a bad mother. Incidentally, I often tell people, if you want to know my definition of hell, it's have children and think there is such a thing as a good parent. You'll spend a good deal of your life being depressed because it's a hard job, it's an important job, and we're going to do things repeatedly we wish we hadn't done. So we need to learn, but without hating ourselves. Because learning that occurs through guilt or shame is costly learning. It's too late now to undo that learning. We have it within ourselves. We've been trained to educate ourselves with these kind of violent judgments. So we show people in our training how, when you are talking to yourself like that, to bring those judgments out into the light, to see what you're telling yourself, to see that this is your way of educating yourself, to call yourself names, to think of what's wrong with you. Then when you see that, we show them how to look behind these judgments to the need which is at the root of them. That is, what need of yours wasn't met by the behavior? And I asked this mother that. What need of yours was not met by how you talked to the child? And with a little help from me, she got in touch with the need. She says, Marshall, I have a real need to respect people, especially my children. Talking to my child that way didn't meet my need for respect. And I say, now that your attention is on your needs, how do you feel? She says, I'm sad. I say, how does that sadness feel compared to what you were thinking a few moments ago when you were thinking that you're a terrible mother and that other judgments that you were making of yourself? She says, it's almost like a sweet pain now. Yes, because it's a natural pain, you see. To be in touch with the needs of ours that weren't met by our behavior I call that mourning, mourning our actions, but mourning without blaming ourselves, mourning without thinking there's something wrong with us for doing what we did. And when I help people to get to that connection, they often describe the pain in a similar way that she does. It's almost like a sweet pain compared to the depression, the guilt, the shame we feel when we are educating ourselves through blame and judgments. I then asked her 
to look at the good reasons why she did what she did. She said, huh? I say, let's look at the good reasons you did what you did. I don't understand what you mean. You mean screaming at the child the way I did? What do you mean by good reason? I say, it's important for us to be conscious that we never do anything except for good reasons. I don't think any human being does anything except for good reasons. And what are those good reasons? To meet a need. Everything we do is in the service of needs. So I said, what need were you trying to meet when you talked to the child that way? She said, are you saying it was right? I'm not saying it was right to talk to the child that way. I'm not saying it was wrong. I'm suggesting that we learn to look at the needs we're trying to meet by doing what we did. We can learn best from it if we do two things. First, see the need that wasn't met by the behavior. And next, to be conscious of the need we were trying to meet by doing what we did. When we have our consciousness on those two needs, I believe it heightens our ability to learn from our limitations without losing self-respect. So, what was your need that we were trying to meet by saying what you did to the child at that time? And she says, Marcel, I really have a need for the child to be protected in, in life, and, and if this child doesn't learn how to do things differently, I'm really scared of what could happen to them. Yes. So, you really have a need for your child's well-being, and you were trying to contribute to it. But she says, that's a terrible way to do it, to scream like that. Well, <laughs> we've already looked at that part of yourself that doesn't like what you did. It didn't meet your need to respect other people. But now let's be conscious of what need of yours was met by doing it. You care for the child. You wanted to protect the child's well-being. Yes. I believe we have a much better chance to learn how to handle other situations in the future if we ask ourselves, how could I have met both needs? Like now, when you have those two needs in mind, can you imagine how you might have expressed yourself differently? She said, oh, yes, yes, I can see that if I had been in touch with those needs, I would have expressed myself quite differently. So this is how we show people how to use nonviolent communication within themselves. When we do something that we don't like, how first to mourn, to empathize with ourself, the need of ours that wasn't met. And very often we'll have to do that by hearing through these judgments that we have been programmed to think in terms of. And in this way we can make good use of our depression, guilt, and shame those feelings we can use as an alarm clock to wake us up to the fact that at this moment we're really not connected to life, life defined as being in touch with our needs. We're up in our head playing violent games with ourselves, calling ourselves names. So if we can learn how to empathically connect with the need of ours that didn't get met and then look at the part of ourself that was trying to meet a need of ours to see what it was. Now that part of ourself that did the act, it's often not easy to empathically connect with that need. We chose to behave that way to meet a need. and So then we need to direct our attention to what need of mine was trying to be met. A very important part of nonviolent communication is this recognition of choice at every moment. At every moment we choose to do what we do. We don't do anything that isn't coming out of choice. And every choice we make is in the service of a need. Any living phenomenon, I would say that's true about. Whether it's a dog or a human being, every choice we make is in the service of a need. So that's how nonviolent communication works within us. We need to learn how to create peace within ourselves when there's a conflict between what we do and what we wish we had done. But by saying that, I'm not saying that we have to get totally liberated from all of our inner violent learning before we look outside ourselves to the world and see how we can contribute to social change at a broader level. I'm saying we need to do these simultaneously. We need to be conscious of the work we need to do within ourselves if we're going to be effective in our social change work. And while we're doing that, we also need to look outside of ourselves to the changes we would like to see happen. 
So let's look at some other changes and how nonviolent communication can help us. We want people to change behavior, not because they're going to be punished if they continue. We want them to change the behavior because they see other options that better meet their needs at less cost. I tried to make this point clear to a mother in Switzerland at a workshop of mine. She said, Marshall, how do I get my son to stop smoking? I said, is that your objective, to get him to stop smoking? She said, yes. I said, then he'll continue. She said, huh, what do you mean? I said, whenever our objective is to get somebody to stop doing something, we lose power. If we really want to have power in change, whether it's personal change, changing an individual, or changing society, we need to come from a consciousness of how the world can be better. And we want people to come out of that consciousness to see how their needs can better be met at less cost. We then looked at how this would apply to her situation with her child. And she was in great pain about this because she was worried about his health. For two years, he had been smoking and they had almost daily fights about his smoking. And her objective was to get him to stop. And she was trying to tell him how horrible it was. So she said, Marshall, how would nonviolent communication help me in this situation? Well, I said, I hope we've got the first part clear. Your objective is not to get him to stop. It's to help him find other ways of meeting whatever needs the smoking is meeting at less cost. She says, that's, that's helpful. That's really helpful now. But how do I communicate with him? Well, I would suggest beginning by sincerely communicating to him that you see that his smoking is absolutely the most wonderful thing he could be doing. She said, huh? What do you mean? I said, he wouldn't be smoking if it wasn't meeting his needs. So if we can sincerely show an empathic connection with what needs he's trying to meet, he sees that we understand why he's doing it. We're not judging him or blaming him for it. When people feel that quality of understanding, then they're much more open to hearing other options. But if they think we have single-mindedness of purpose to change them, that they feel they're being blamed for what they're doing, it makes change difficult. So the first step is to sincerely communicate that you see that what he's doing is the absolutely most wonderful way he knows how to meet his needs. This woman came back after lunch and she was glowing, just glowing. And she said, Marshall, thank you so much for what you taught me this morning. She said, I had the most wonderful communication with my son over lunchtime. I said, how did you get home so quickly? Because this workshop was taking place up in the mountains. She said, no, no, I called him up on the phone. And we had the most wonderful communication. I said, well, tell me about it. Well, she said, first of all, when I called home, his 13-year-old brother answered. And I said, quick, uh, put your brother on the phone. I want to talk to him. And uh, my 13-year-old said, uh, well, uh, uh, he's on the back porch. And the mother told me, then I knew he was smoking. Because after two years of fighting about the smoking, at least... He agreed that if he would smoke, he would do it outside and not inside. So I said to my 13-year-old son, that's okay, just tell him I want to talk to him. So now the 15-year-old comes on the phone and says, what do you want? And the mother said, I learned something about your smoking today that I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, what? She said, I've learned it's the most wonderful thing you could be doing. Now, I said to the mother, uh, that wasn't exactly how I meant for you to do that. I, I was really meaning that we communicate that through empathic connection by showing that you understand. She said, oh, oh I got that, Marshall. I, I understood that. But, you know, I know this guy, and, and I really felt I could get that across to him much quicker by just saying the statement that I, I see that it's the most wonderful thing you could be doing. Well, I said, you know him. Okay, so what happened? She said, Marshall, what happened was profound especially if you knew how much we had fought about this. First, he was silent for a very long time. And then he said, I'm not so sure about that. You see, once people don't have to defend themselves against our single-mindedness of purpose to change them, once they feel understood for what they're doing, it's much easier for them to be open to other possibilities. 
So there we've seen how nonviolent communication helps us to bring about change within ourself, change with other people, but it requires this need consciousness. It requires an awareness that all blame, all judgments, like I'm dirt, like I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict, these self-judgments get in the way of learning. Makes it hard to learn more effective ways of living at less cost. But now let's take a look at not individuals that we would like to change. Let's look at how nonviolent communication can help us transform gangs, gangs that behave in ways we don't like. Some gangs call themselves gangs, street gangs. They're not the ones that scare me the most. Some gangs call themselves governments. So many of the people that I'm working with around the world, it's not individual behaviors that concern them. It's what these various kinds of gangs are doing. I would hope we all have a consciousness of how gang behavior affects how we are educated, what we carry within ourselves. Let me show you what I mean. I've been suggesting that certain language, certain communication has been very destructive. But where did this come from? Where did this language come from? These moralistic judgments. Where did these tactics of punishment and reward come from? Why do we use them? We learn these tactics because they support certain gang behavior. For example, let's look at our schools. Our schools teach people according to Michael Katz, an educational historian who studied educational change. And from the history of public education in the United States, about every 20 years, citizens start to get concerned and at great risk make educational changes that are very good from the standpoint of kids learn more, there's less violence in the school. But in these new schools, within five years they're gone. And in his book, Cast Bureaucracy in the Schools, Michael Katz shows why he thinks this is so. He says the problem is the reformers try to show what's wrong with the schools and try to change that. They don't see what's right with them. The schools are doing what they were set up to do, which is to support gang behavior. Which gang? The economic structure gang. The people who control our businesses. They control our schools. They have their own idea of how education should be, which is to do three things in our schools. First, to teach people obedience to authority. So when they get hired, they'll do what they're told. Second, the schools are set up to get people to work for extrinsic rewards. Not because what they're learning is going to enrich their lives, but so they'll get grades, they'll get rewarded, so they'll get better high-paying jobs in the future. If you're going to hire a person in a gang that puts out a product or service that doesn't really serve life, but makes a lot of money for the owners of this gang, you want workers who aren't asking themselves, is this product we're turning out really serving life? No, no, you don't want them to ask that question. You just want them to do what they're told and to work for a salary. And Michael Katz says the third function of our schools that makes it hard to change them, that they're doing well, is to maintain a caste system and make it look like a democracy. So our educational system is set up so that people from elite positions will continue in an elite position because they already are taught what's mostly taught in the schools before they go into the classroom so they get the highest grades. So it's not individuals that they want to change, but it's a structure like the schools. They want to transform the schools so that the schools better serve people than the way they're set up. Now, this doesn't mean the teachers within the schools are enemies. No, not at all. They really genuinely want to contribute to children's well-being. There's no enemies here. It's the structure. It's the gang that is the problem. The structures that we have set up to maintain our economy. So one evidence of that is the schools. So 
We may want to use social change by radically transforming schools. So in several countries now, we're working with citizens and making radical transformations in schools so that schools, the teachers, the students work in harmony with the principles of nonviolent communication. But the schools themselves, I'm suggesting, are controlled by a broader gang, the economic gang, the economic structure gang. So we need to not only change the schools, but we need to realize that the schools are part of a bigger structure. We know that this is horrible that this happens, but it's the system, the gang, that needs to change. The individuals within it are not monsters, but it's the gangs we need to change. Well, how do we get the energy to do all this work? I mean, how do we work on ourselves to transform the world within ourselves? How do we have human connections with our people around us? And then how do we have enough energy left over to tackle these larger gangs? when we have been so affected internally by these gangs that it's all we can take care of just to get ourselves and our own families in order. Another important part of social change is gratitude. But not just social change. Gratitude is very necessary to sustain the kind of spiritual consciousness that nonviolent communication tries to support. Because when we know how to express and receive gratitude in a certain way, it gives us enormous energy to sustain our social change efforts, but to sustain it through the beauty of what can be, rather than out of an attempt to conquer evil forces. I first got a heavy dose of how important gratitude could be by working with a powerful social change group in Iowa, and I was admiring what they had been getting done, and I felt honored that they wanted me to show them how nonviolent communication might help them in their social change efforts. But one thing was driving me a little batty in my three days with them. Each day they would stop at least a couple times to express gratitude, to celebrate things that they wanted to celebrate. And at that time, I was so preoccupied by how much needed to be done in the world that this was very frustrating to me to stop a meeting and just give celebration. We've got so much racism, sexism, all of these things, they need to change. And so I was kind of preoccupied so much with what needed to be done that I didn't see much room for celebration. So on the third evening after our work was done, I was having dinner with the, the leader of this group. She said, what was it like working with our organization? And I said, well, to tell you the truth, I admire very much what you folks are getting done. It was a pleasure to be here. One thing that was a little awkward for me was how often you stop and celebrate and give thanks. And I'm just not used to that. And she said, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Marshall. There's something I wanted to talk to you about. Aren't you worried about any social change effort that's just so preoccupied with how horrible things are that you come from that energy rather than reminding yourself constantly of the beautiful side of life. And so that's why we do gratitude in our social change efforts. We want to all along, even though we know there's so much to be done, we want to really stop and give gratitude to whatever people are doing that is really supporting what we're working toward. And that started me thinking of how much my consciousness was shaped by how bad things are and how much they need to happen and and how much even in my social change efforts this then was creating me being a pretty scary guy so intent and from that point to the moment which has been about 30 years now I have been working very hard to build in the expression of gratitude into our training in nonviolent communication to see how it can sustain our living in harmony with our spiritual values because the more we express and receive gratitude in a certain way, the more it reminds us of the spirituality that nonviolent communication tries to support. As I've said, our spirituality that we're trying to support is to make people conscious moment by moment that we human beings, our purpose in life comes from compassionate giving, compassionate service, there's nothing more wonderful than exercising our power in the service of life. That's a manifestation of our divine energy within us, that that is our greatest joy, to use our efforts in the service of life. 
So we show people how to express and receive gratitude in nonviolent communication in a way that has that effect, that helps us to sustain our lives in harmony with that spirituality. But that means being conscious of how often we have been taught to express gratitude directly counter to supporting that kind of spirituality. So in nonviolent communication, we suggest never to give compliments or praise. To see that saying to somebody, you did a good job, you're a kind person, you're very competent, that's still using moralistic judgments. That's still creating a world different than the world that Rumi is talking about when he says there is a place beyond rightness and wrongness. I'll meet you there. When we're using judgmental words, praise and compliments, it's the same form of language as saying to somebody, you're unkind, you're stupid, you're selfish. So, we suggest to people to be conscious that the positive judgments are equally as dehumanizing to people as the negative judgments. And we also suggest be particularly conscious of how destructive it is to give positive feedback as a reward. Don't dehumanize people by complimenting them or praising them. Now, when I say this to managers in industry or to teachers, they're often shocked. They've often been in training programs that teach them to compliment and praise employees or students daily because performance rises. And I point out to such people that if you look at the research, you will see that, yes, children work harder when they're praised and complimented. Employees work harder when they're praised and complimented for a very short time until they sense the manipulation, until they sense that this is not the real stuff, this is not gratitude from the heart. This is another manipulation, another way of trying to get you to do things. And when people sense the manipulation, the production no longer stays high. If you want to read further the danger of using praise and compliments and other rewards, read Elfie Cohn's book, Punished by Rewards, to see the violence of rewards, to see that it's the same violence as punishment. They both are means of control over people. In nonviolent communication, we want to increase power, but power with people, not over them. So, how do we express and receive gratitude in nonviolent communication? First, the intent is all important. The intent is to celebrate life, nothing else. We're not trying to reward the other person. We want the other person to know how our life has been enriched by what they did. That's our only intent. And to make clear how our life has been enriched, we need to say to people three things to make it clear. Praise and compliments don't make these three things clear. First, we want to make clear what the person did that we want to celebrate. What action on their part enriched our lives? Second, we want to tell them how we feel about that. What feelings are alive in us as a result of what they've done? And third, what needs of ours were met? I hadn't made this clear to a group of teachers I was dealing with. We ran out of time this day, and just as I was talking about how to express gratitude in nonviolent communication. And after the meeting, one of the teachers ran up to me, and here's how she expressed her gratitude to me. Her eyes were shining, and she said, You're brilliant! I said to her, It doesn't help. She says, What? I said, Telling me what I am doesn't help. I have been called a lot of names in my life some positive and some far from positive, and I can't ever recall learning anything of value by somebody telling me what I am. I don't think anybody does. I think there's zero information value in being told what you are. But from the look in your eyes, I can see you want to express a gratitude. She says, yes, and I want to receive it, but telling me what I am doesn't give it to me. Well, she said, what do you want me to say? I said, remember what I said in the workshop today. I need to hear three things. First of all, what did I do that made life so wonderful for you? She thought for a moment and said, you're so intelligent. No, I said, that's still a diagnosis of me. It doesn't really tell me what I did. I, I'd get more out of your feedback if I knew concretely what I did that really in some way enriched your life. Oh, she says, I got you. I think I understand. 
She opened up her notebook, and she pointed to two things she wrote there and had a big star by them. She said, you said these two things. I looked in her notebook. Yes, I did say those two things. I said, that helps. See, just knowing that that in some way enriched your life. Second, I said, it would help me to know how you feel right now. Oh, Marshal, I feel so relieved and hopeful. Oh, and now third, what need of yours was met by those two things? Marshal, I've never been able to connect with my 18-year-old son. All we do is fight. I have been needing some concrete direction for connecting with him. These two things you said met that need of mine for some concrete direction. So you can see, I'm sure, how different it was to hear those three things than to hear somebody tell me what I was. So that's how we express gratitude in nonviolent communication. Now I'd like to suggest how to receive gratitude in nonviolent communication. And we find in every country how hard it is for people to receive gratitude because their prior training has taught them that you should be humble, you shouldn't think you're anything. And so it's very hard for people to receive gratitude. For example, English-speaking people, they often look terrified when you express gratitude to them. And here's what they say. Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. French people, same thing. De rien. Spanish, de nada. Swedish, ash. So all over the world I've asked people, what makes it so hard to receive gratitude? Here's the answers I get. Well, I didn't know that I deserved it. See, this horrible concept of deserve... So you have to earn things, you see? So it makes it hard even to receive gratitude. You have to worry about whether you earned it. Or sometimes they'll say, well, uh, what's wrong with being humble? Well, I said it depends what you mean by humility. There's different kinds of humility. There's the kind that I think is unfortunate because it deprives us of seeing our power, our beauty. I like the way Golda Meir, the Israeli prime minister, talked about this false humility to one of her politicians. She said to him once, Don't be so humble. You're not that great. But I think the most important reason why people find it hard to receive gratitude is powerfully spelled out in The Course in Miracles. They say in The Course in Miracles, It's our light, not our darkness, that scares us the most. You see, sadly, we've been educated for all these years, 8,000 years, in this world of moralistic judgments, of retributive justice, punishment, reward, deserve. We've internalized this language of judgments, and it's hard for us to stay connected to the beauty of what we are within that framework. So nonviolent communication shows us to have the courage to not be scared of facing the power and the beauty that is in each of us. But this is what you will hear behind every message coming at you from another human being if you connect to the divine energy in that person at that moment. My name is Marshall Rosenberg. <laughs> See me beautiful, look for the best in me, that's what I really am, and all I want to be, it may take some time, it may be hard to find, but see me beautiful. And every day Could you take a chance Could you find a way To see me shining through In everything I do And see me beautiful
concludes Speaking Peace with Marshall Rosenberg. Original music by Marshall Rosenberg and additional music by Stephen McNamara. For more information on the work of Marshall Rosenberg and the Center for Nonviolent Communication, please contact them at www.cnvc.org. If you would like additional copies of this audio learning program or to receive a free catalog of audio, video, and music for the inner life, please contact Sounds True, www.soundstrue.com, or call us toll-free, 1-800-333-9185, or write the Sounds True catalog, P.O. Box 8010, Boulder, Colorado, 80306. Thank you for listening. So it's not some mysterious thing. It may be wonderful, but it's not really mysterious. It's part of physics. If physics is a part of science, talking about energy is scientific, even though people get nervous about it. So energy flow is what is shared in relationships, right? Right now, between me and you, with light, photons, and sound, air molecules moving, we are sharing energy information flow. I'm watching your handsome and beautiful faces and soaking it in. It's very different if I were just looking at a little pinhole of a camera, which you do when you do these online things. It's just a lot different. We're connecting with each other. So we come with this view that relationships can be defined as the sharing of energy and information flow. The brain in its body, the embodied brain, is the embodied mechanism of that flow. But here's the amazing thing. When you look at it this way, you come up with this wild proposal that the mind, beyond subjective experience, consciousness, and even information flow, perhaps, and maybe it's related to this fourth one, is that this is a part of a system. Now, what is the system that would include your relationships and your embodied brain? Well, this is, again, another two months of discussions. <laughs> now, in one minute, I'm going to give it to you. But the way to talk about it is it's part of what's called a complex system, which is a mathematical term. And once you look at these criteria that say this is a complex system, mathematics demonstrates, not as a hypothesis, but as a fact of the universe, that there are what are called emergent properties. One of those emergent properties that math states is called self-organization. So the proposal is, what if the mind, beyond subjective experience, consciousness, and information processing, maybe they're related or not, let's now look at the fourth facet of mind, is the self-organizing process of this complex system. Then, when you look at this definition, what's interesting about it, number one, it says that it's emerging from and also regulating the thing itself, so it's why the mind has a mind of its own. Anyone ever feel like your mind has a mind of its own? Raise your hand. The second thing it does for this talk that's really important is it says, you are not just your body. If your self comes from your mind, this is saying, you know something? You are not just your brain. That the mind is emerging as much from relationality as it is from your brain. So... Um, Caroline and I went to Namibia recently to do some research work and, and clinical work with different tribes that were there, and there's a horrible famine going on in Namibia, and there's also a drought, and there's also terrible diseases going around. And um, one of the things that's amazing about Namibia is we know from linguistic studies and genetic studies that the tribes that are there are 
individuals who are as closely related to who we think were the original human beings that we can find on the planet. So it's a really interesting, from a scientific point of view, group to, to hang with and talk with. And so we were doing that. We were talking with them, getting to know them. And around the campfire one night, I said to the translator, I said, can I ask you to ask this tribesman a question? He goes, sure, what's the question? I said, they've got drought, they've got famine, they've got disease, and they're so happy. <laughs> and he looks at me, I said, can you ask him why his fellow villagers look so happy? Are they really so happy? He goes, you want me to ask him why they're happy? I said, yeah, ask him why they're happy. So he translates it, and he gets a response, and I will never forget that moment when the villager says in his language and the translator translates it into these words. He says, he says his people are happy because they belong. They belong to each other and they belong to earth. And then there's this pause and I'm going, oh my God. And then the villager asked the translator, asked me a question, and he says, in America, do you belong? And I thought about back home, here, and I thought about our modern culture, wherever it is, and I thought, oh my God, we have pulled ourselves out of belonging in the most unhealthy way. You can imagine, maybe even starting with Hippocrates, to say that the mind is just the activity of the brain, which was a physician's attempt to try to make sense of things. We can honor that. And William James was just honoring that. Great. But it's not only um, maybe not the full story, but there's a problem we have. You know, it's incredible to be here in San Francisco because the last time I was up here, I was asked to go and teach at some high schools down the peninsula. And, you know, there's a train that goes here from San Francisco down to San Jose. And at the high school, when these really, really devoted adolescents wouldn't get the grades they were supposed to get, they would jump in front of the train. And there were a lot of suicides. And so they asked me to come talk to the kids and the parents and the teachers and the administrators about what they could do. So the adolescents, actually, some of the students interviewed me beforehand. They got their cameras set up, and they, they interviewed the talk I gave. You can watch it from our website. But the thing that really struck me as I was looking at their faces was, what is going on in our modern society that we create such lack of belonging that some young person with all the hope and possibility that exists would jump in front of a train? Many of them would do that. We have to think about that and take responsibility for what we're doing, which is what I said to them. We've created this culture that has a lethal lie that the self is the same as your brain, that the self is separate, and that relationships don't really have anything to do with it, or maybe they're icing on the cake. They're not icing on the cake. They are the cake. When I hear you mention the light in The Course of Miracles, uh, and some of the other things that you say, I feel curious about the spiritual groundwork from which, from which your model springs. Mm -hmm. And I'd like understanding, and I wonder if you would be willing to share with us your perception of the spiritual groundwork or your spiritual path mm -hmm. or journey or practice. Yeah, so let me sing you a song to make that part of clear. I had uh, an uncle who would come to my house each night when I was a child to help my mother take care of my grandmother, who was totally paralyzed with L Lou Gehrig's disease, runs in our family. He read uh, Tuesdays with Maury. He had the uh, same thing. And um, totally paralyzed. And so this uncle of mine would come, and every night I couldn't wait to go and watch him clean my grandmother up. And I never knew as a child why I did this, because she smelled and it's kind of disgusting. But why I did is it was like a mystery to me, because the whole time he was doing it, 
He had the most wonderful smile on his face, as though he was getting the greatest gift a man could get. As a kid, I couldn't understand it, but it, 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 it had such a power with me. So uh, many years later, many years later, uh, I was reading a book by John Powell, Secret of Staying in Love, and uh, there's a part in there that touched me very much about unexpressed gratitude, how horrible he was thinking it is that he didn't get a chance to express certain gratitudes to certain people before they died for various reasons. And that really woke me up. I said, oh my God, yeah, who, who is, is alive still that I... And I realized I had never told the uncle what that meant to me. And I knew he was near death at the time, so I got to him and uh, I put into words, the best words could do, what that smile meant to me. And I asked him, uh, where did you get that? Where did you get whatever it took for you to get joy that way in life? And he liked the question. He really did. He took it as a... And he thought seriously about it. And he said, I had great teachers. And I said, like, like whom? He said, well, you saw me taking care of your grandmother when she was... Um, paralyzed, but you you probably don't remember when you were a little boy but what she was like before. And he said, for example, have you, have you heard what kind of woman she was? Uh, has your mother told you, for example, about the tailor and his wife? And I said, oh yes, you mean during the Depression she saw the tailor crying on a street corner and she found out that he lost his his shop and he didn't know where he was going to live and how he was going to tell his wife and two kids. Yes, yeah, my mother told me that and how she invited them into the house and how they lived in the house for three years. Yes, yes, yes. I heard that. I, that stayed with me, Uncle, because when we live in the house now, I, I keep wondering, where did they all sleep? She had nine children. She had no money. Uh, I often wondered, uh, we have trouble now, we're crowded. Where did the nine kids plus the tailor, his wife, and two kids, where did they sleep? I never could figure it out as a kid. I wondered that. And then he said, well, did your mother tell you the story about so-and-so? I said, yes. And the story about so-and-so? I said, yes. And then he said, well, surely she told you about Jesus. I said, who? <laughs> he said, didn't she tell you about Jesus? Well, no, no. And he said, well, one day a man came to the back door wild, scraggly, back black hair, dirty, smelled, and around his neck he had a tree branch in the rough shape of a cross held around his neck with a rope, asking for food. That part wasn't strange, because everybody in the neighborhood knew that Grandma, even though she was poor, she would feed anybody who showed up. Uh, so while he's eating at the kitchen, she asked him, what's your name? And he said, Jesus. She said, do you have a last name? I'm Jesus the Lord. Now, my grandmother's English wasn't good, and so when an uncle came in later, she introduced him as Mr. the Lord. <laughs> and uh, she said, uh, where do you live? He said, I don't have a home. She said, uh, well, where are you going to sleep tonight? It's very cold. I don't know. She said, would you like to stay here? He stayed seven years. So one other thing you need to know about the spirituality in addition to that, that part will get you a peek into the spirituality I learned. The other part about my grandmother that I learned from her spirituality, she was rigid about one thing, fanatic about one thing. She used to say, never walk when you can dance. She used to love to dance. She was a very heavy, big woman, but she was light on her feet. She would dance for certain benefits. So... It was in her Jewish way. She taught me what Jesus had to say. 
in that precious way. She taught me what Jesus had to say. One day a man named Jesus came around to Grandma's door. He asked for a little food. She gave him more. He said he was Jesus the Lord. She didn't check him out with Rome. He stayed for several years, as many did without a home. It was in a Jewish way. She taught me what Jesus had to say. In that precious way, she taught me what Jesus had to say. And that's feed the hungry, heal the sick, then take a rest. Never walk when you can dance, make your home a cozy nest. Yes, feed the hungry, heal the sick, then take a rest. Never walk when you can dance, make your home a cozy nest. It was in a Jewish way, she taught me what Jesus had to say. In her precious way, she taught me what Jesus had to say. Does that give you a peek of what spirituality I've learned? And you know, I've done that song all over the world now, and one of the things I love doing it is there's somebody like that in everybody's family, and I hear about it, so I know they're all over. And that's the energy that's going to create the world.